I'm talking today with Professor Wendy Brown, who is the clinical lead for the Bariatric Surgery Registry and is also uh, the Chair of Surgery at the Alfred in Melbourne and Director of the Centre for the Obesity Research and Education at Monash Uni. Thanks, Wendy, for your time. Thank you for coming along. No worries. Now, you've written a perspective for, um, for the MJA on the Bariatric Surgery Registry and you've talked specifically about the ethical concerns and how you go about collecting the data in a comprehensive standard way. Why is a registry necessary for bariatric surgery in Australia? Um, the Bariatric Surgery Registry is a clinical quality and safety registry, um, meaning that it's been set up so that we can monitor the safety and the efficacy of bariatric surgery across our country. The reason that we need this is that um, bariatric surgery is a relatively new area of surgery. Mm -hmm. um, it's really it's only been done in large numbers in Australia since about 2004. And with this, there's been the profession recognised there was a need to monitor and track our outcomes to ensure that we were doing the right things for patients, we were offering them a procedure that was effective, yep. but also a procedure that was safe. Because people are coming to us with um, obesity as their disease, they're not necessarily dying of it straight away. It's not yeah. a disease that is going to kill them like cancer. And therefore, but they will be definitely impacted on by the diseases of obesity down the track. Mm. So therefore we need to be offering them a solution that is as safe as possible because we don't want to create new diseases or end their lives um, prematurely through yep. our surgical procedures. Are there guidelines in Australia for who should be getting the surgery and what kind of devices they should be getting? There are guidelines that were created in the early 90s, so they're probably a bit wow. out of date yes. um, because they really preceded the laparoscopic era. Yeah. So laparoscopic surgery really started in Australia around 91, 92, and the numbers of obesity surgery started going up around the same time because in the past, bariatric procedures were around. For example, the Ruwai bypass has been around since 1967, yeah. um, but it was only offered in the open form, and that was a very, very morbid procedure with up to 5% mortality, so wow. nobody you know, really embraced that as an option. Yeah. But with the advent of laparoscopic surgery, we could offer things much more safely, and that's when um, the procedure started taking off. So the NIH guidelines that were written in 1992 don't really reflect the year of um, when obesity surgery was done open, and so the guidelines are that you have to have a BMI greater than 35, plus a comorbidity that could be improved by weight loss, yep. substantial weight loss, yep. and or a BMI greater than 40, because, um, saying at the time they calculated the risk and the risk of dying from a disease of obesity was less than the risk of dying from surgery yeah. um, was was greater sorry than the risk of dying from surgery yes. um, if once the BMI hit that sort of 40 mark. There's now been a number of trials that suggest that we should be offering surgery to people with a BMI of 30 to 35 if they have a comorbidity that will be improved by like um, substantial weight loss, like, like um, diabetes, exactly. Yeah. However, the official guidelines haven't been adapted, but in clinical practice, we tend to offer surgery if their BMI is over 30 and between 30 and 35 if they have a comorbidity that we think will substantially improve with um, substantial weight loss. So how many hospitals around the country are doing bariatric surgery? We estimate 164. Okay. Um, it's a bit of a flux number because <laughs> you know some new hospitals open, hospitals close, yep. practitioners retire. Um, so we think 164 hospitals, which is around 196 um, surgeons. Yeah. When somebody's doing a, an RCT, for example, they have to get ethics approval from an ethics committee. What, what are the differences between the ethics approval needed for trials and, and ethics approval needed for registers? Because obviously you've got privacy concerns. What are, what are the differences there? So a clinical trial is usually um, testing a new innovation or a new mm -hmm. intervention against best practice or against the gold standard which would be your control group. Yep. And so it's important that you have total informed consent um, from the, the, um, the patients who are being enrolled yep. and also that you have, I guess, you consider you've got um, disease equipoise or intervention equipoise so that what you're offering is unlikely to cause harm mm -hmm. to one or the other groups. And so it is important that each of those things goes through a very careful HREC or Human Research Ethics Committee um, yep. review and it is important patients are fully informed and they provide informed consent. With registries, what we're doing is collecting whole of population data. Yeah. 
Because this is a quality and safety registry, we're predominantly looking to see what are the outcomes of bariatric surgery and are there outliers in terms of devices, procedures, surgeons, hospitals yeah. um, that are performing these operations. Um, it's important that we get around about at least 95% of the baseline procedures enrolled. We know that we need that large um, cohort or whole of population cohort because there's been some other registries overseas where they, the, the famous example is the Canadian Stroke Registry, yes. where they used to do opt-in consent where they got direct patient consent and the patient, um, when, when they did it that way they got about 60% of patients agreeing to participate. Yep. And when they moved to an opt-out process where the patients had to say only if they didn't want to be included, they've suddenly got 95% of the patients enrolled. Right. And that changed their results completely. Yeah. What they thought was true turned out to be false, and that's because of, of sample bias. Yeah. And so with a quality and safety registry, it's critical that we get 95% of the population to avoid that population bias. Yeah. So we are holding identifiable data that's sensitive, and under Australian um, privacy laws, quite rightly, we need to seek patients' permission to hold their information. Yes. But we need to do that in such a way that we are still able to accrue, to achieve our aim yeah. of getting 95% of the population. So we do tend to rely on an opt-out process whereby we send the information to the patient and they have the opportunity to say, no, I do not want to consider the information, say, no, I do not want to participate and ring a freeway 1-800 number so that they can have their, their information removed. Right. The consent process is different to a randomised controlled trial. The ethics review process needs to be the same, but typically controlled um, RCTs will be held at a few different sites or yeah. one site, and that usually can be done under mutual recognition. Um, and usually ethics committees, when it's over, a few sites can sort of agree to disagree or find a common ground. When you're going to 164 different ethics committees, yes it becomes quite burdensome because each ethics committee might think this paragraph should be worded this way. Yeah. Because we're human beings, we can all find a better way to do something. Yes. Um, and so fortunately a large number as we've gone through the process have started to recognise other ethics committee's approvals. But there is still a challenge when you're trying to roll something out nationally. So how many of those 164 on? hospitals have signed up to the registry? Um, as of last week, 109, uh, sorry, out of 164, 82. We're cool. just about to sign another 13 and, um, from one private hospital group and another 23 from another private hospital group. So right. that will leave us with only <coughs> about 30 or 40 sort of smaller player hospitals to go. So in order to get those 80 involved, has it cost the registry money to get the ethics done? We've had to employ one and a half full-time people mm -hmm. just to work on ethics. Wow. Um, plus there's my time, which I guess is donated, and yeah. then there's the opportunity cost that we could have had a research and assistant and a half yes, um, instead, actually doing yeah. some of the work rather than concentrating on ethics applications. And you've got to remember it's not just the initial application, there's annual reporting, yeah. plus every time we change something, so if one ethics committee says, no, we really object to this paragraph, yeah. if we change the patient information and consent form, we've got to go back to every uh. single ethics committee. Yeah. Every time personnel change, we have to go back to every single ethics committee wow. to let them know. So what's the solution? There must be a way of standardising this process, surely. Up front, I think Australian privacy laws are great. It's yep. great that we protect the privacy of our patients. It's great that agencies can't just freely throw our inf private information around. Yes. And I think it's important. But I do think we should look at something that's a bit more streamlined and centralised. In New Zealand, for example, they have one ethics committee that works for the whole nation. Is there any other way of, of standardising things? You can do the applications which multi-site applications, right, yeah. um, but they're very difficult to make fit to the registry model. Mm -hmm. They're really written more for trials. And so maybe if there was a modified application that we could do that yeah. could go to, if, and if it wasn't, because we are a federation of states, which also complicates things. Yes. Um, if we could have one that could go to a lead site that is accredited by the Australian Quality and Safety Commission as a site that's able to assess these things, yeah. um, then we could, do one in each state that, and then have a, like a mutual recognition form. But there has to be a more streamlined way. And I don't object to taking it to every site because I want every hospital that we're going to to understand what we're doing. Yes. I think it's, it's an opportunity for us 
to engage people and understand why we think this is important. Yeah. But there are ways that that process could be a lot better. So Thanks for your time. <laughs> no problems. <laughs>